This video is brought to you by a whole lot of changes done in the anime, including the hint towards Yuna in the SAO servers. We had a packed episode this week again, drama on Ocean Turtle because Kirito took Yanai's girl, Shinon summons more than just her courage to the field, the devil's child descends onto the field, and the anime stays 15 pages short of finishing volume 17, Alsatian Awakening, to replace the perfect cliffhanger with an anime original one. Welcome everyone, it's me GamerTurk, your best source of Swart Online information, and this is Elicization Explained, featuring War of Underworld Episode 16, Code 871. Short overview, we have adapted from Volume 17, El Session Awakening, Chapter 21, Midway, Part 3, up until shortly before the end of Part 4, about 45 pages, again leading to a significantly accurate adaptation, let's say, which means we had minor drops here and there, but nothing I would deem major per se, but we stopped 15 pages before the end of the book and its intended cliffhanger, which was quite the weird choice, especially considering the anime sneaked in its own anime original cliffhanger with the SAO servers at the old Argus headquarters for even more age and Yuna teases that we will talk about in a bit. To add, the next episode seemingly will shuffle some events too, but we'll talk about all that in much more detail shortly. I should probably work on the Cordial Chords video this week too, definitely gonna be relevant very soon. But if you're new to my Explained series, what I do here is essentially provide you all the vital information on characters, events, action, lore from the source material, light novels, things that the anime did not convey properly or just did not have the time to so you can still see the full picture. If you want to jump the specific events, timestamps will be in the description along with Amazon and Book Depository affiliate links so you can grab the light novels for yourselves. Before Amazon goes through with their crusade against light novels, go get them while you still can as more and more light novels have been disappearing from their offers lately. Also, Medina, Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh merch may just be what you're looking for, illustrated by the amazing Gen K, it is available on my Teespring page. With that, let's cast away the sly foxes spreading misinformation and get on with Elicization Explained. We start this week with Yanai. As I said, there was absolutely no way for you to guess his appearance back in Season 1 since he didn't even appear as himself, but rather one of the slugs there. Well, the scene is played out word by word, leaving me not much to tell you on what's going on on the screen. Quite a lot of fine details and Higa's inner monologues were dropped. First question would be as to how Yanai even had a clean background check when Kiku was hiring research staff. After all, Kikoka knew the importance of the research and would surely know who he would be able to trust. Charges of Shigemura Tetsuhiro, Yuna's father, were dropped in exchange for his help on Project Realization, for example, but Yanai was a different matter. He had somehow slipped through his background checks and the fact that he was working for NSA was even more baffling for Higa to process. It was maybe also a result of the nature of Project Elicization. The entirety of Wrath was disguised as a startup company to draw zero attention from outside forces, which led them to barely getting any interest in terms of potential researchers, leading them to being quite desperate. Or maybe it was due to the corrupt nature of the government, which was already the major reason for them being in this situation in the first place. But none of that mattered now. Even the mandatory gun training for all Ocean Turtle researchers had backfired as Yanai clearly knew the safety was off, leaving Higa with no choice but to keep the delusional slug monologuing as much as possible. After the opening we get the beginning of the Shinon vs Subtilizer battle and boy oh boy, I got things to explain here. Visually the scene is adapted stunningly, even the rudimentary scenes, Shinon losing grasp of her consciousness and thus losing her eye color slowly, the incredible attention to detail with the pendant, how she summons Hekate, how Gabe blocks the first bullet but the second one pierces etc and the effects around it, but god damn the context is lacking so much with nothing being said anywhere as to what is happening that I'm baffled why the anime adapted certain things in the first place if they were just gonna let them be there with zero context, just confusing audiences or worse, showcasing the pendant like a literal plot armor piece. I'm, I'm not mad, I'm just excited that for the first time in 4 weeks, I actually do have something juicy to explain in an explained video. So first off, as I imagined, Shinon getting choked was basically negative incarnation on her side, the appearance of Subtilizer triggered her PTSD of their event so hard that she simply felt that final choke for real on herself, effectively her nightmare taking shape. 
What follows is that Subtilizer truly envisioning himself as the one who devours souls, leading to his vision taking shape through his incarnation too. On a technical level, his GGO account doesn't even compare to the Vecta account in terms of stats or abilities, but the incarnation throws the scale way too off as Subti considers himself to be diving who he thinks himself to be. And that's why Shinon still loses her conscience slowly and feels like she is getting sucked into him instead. But then she's suddenly saved by a jolt of heat in between them, and to be frank, the way the anime portrays this looks like a literal plot armor, but it isn't. Well, it is technically an armor and it is very much embedded in the plot deeply. In, in fact, if you look back at episode 1 of the Elicization anime, you will see Shinon wearing that exact same pendant. But there's so much behind it in terms of story. The anime showed the electrode saving Kirito from the poison back in Phantom Bullet, but that was pretty much it. Later that day, the electrode fell off and Shinon found it in her room to symbolize the miracle that saved her and Kirito's life and as a reminder of the bond they shared, Shinon turned the electrode into a pendant. She never told Kirito or Asuna anything about it but kept wearing that pendant since to give her the strength to move forward and to never give up. In her own mind, the pendant was the strongest symbol of the miracle that allowed her to keep going. And in a world where conscious or unconscious thoughts take shape into reality if they are strong enough, in such a circumstance, the symbol of her hopes and strength took solid form once again, effectively letting her escape the grasp of Subtilizer. And once she realized that was how the pendant suddenly appeared as part of her memories and beliefs, she got back to her senses and promised herself to never lose her mind and focus against Subtilizer again, those were the primary traits of a true sniper after all. And with that mindset, she focused on her annihilation bow this time around and summoned her trusty Hecate into existence. You are not God nor the devil, you are just a man. Was basically her proclamation of that, completely throwing away her fears of the devil haunting her in her dreams and getting her mind back into the game. The following couple seconds were from a section slightly further ahead and was changed to a certain extent. You see, sniping someone so close to you, let alone with an extremely long range anti-material rifle, is not a reasonable thing to do. Shinon knew this too, on top of the fact that she was floating in air, so no way to stabilize herself, no foothold, holding a massive gun with a blasting kickback that can, well kick you back unless you have a decent grip on the ground. So unlike the two back to back shots in the anime, Shinon had a much more simple plan. Don't try to aim, pan the sniper slightly and pull the trigger the moment you see the scope full black rather than red, indicating she was on target. The kickback flung her backwards a lot, but that didn't matter as long as that one shot counted. But there was one problem, she had one doubt. Hecate was basically her incarnation, so was the bullet she had just shot. The moment she managed to stabilize herself in the air, what she saw shocked her. The bullet was clashing against Subtilizer's palm. In reality, it could even pierce steel platings, but in Underworld, it was a matter of incarnation. Throughout the entire period, Shinon was still doubting herself. Could Subtilizer even devour her incarnate bullet like it was nothing too? But the moment she cast away her fears and focused on what she believed to be right, an unstoppable bullet that can pierce anything once again, it suddenly burst through the hand. But with him lifting his crossbow and incarnating it into a newer generation 50 caliber anti-material rifle, she now realized she had a challenge to overcome in front of her. Now over to the Human Guardian army. As before, Asuna is aiming to prioritize the lives of Underworlders who only have a single life to give, but compared to the Americans earlier who were relatively organized and reserved in their combat that they would be able to strategize against, the new Korean and Chinese enemies were simply attacking with pure rage and no predictability at all. An enemy with absolutely no worries of losing their lives as long as they can do some damage and they were doing some damage with their higher numbers. ALO leaders and their elite squads were fighting formidably, but it wasn't enough. With salamanders breaking the enemy line, Sakuya was planning to secure a corridor long enough 
to allow the human guardian army to escape. But what happens next was even cheesy to read in the novel. Someone who is so aware and in control of the situation like Sakuya should not have given in just to help out Alicia Rue. You know, people complain about silliest things because they simply don't know better Kirta's plot armor, why was Fanatio frozen, then unfrozen, Shinon's pendant, etc. All have explicit and clear reasons. Meanwhile, I complain about this scene here because there's absolutely no reason for Sakuya to do such a thing and leave the Sylphs leaderless. She, she just knows better, you know, making her scene cool and goddamn it was a short but very cool cut it doesn't help make her decision come off any more reasonable. I mean, it's somewhat implied that Sakuya is college friends with Alicia in a single sentence in the books in this entire scene, but that's pretty much it, which doesn't explain her decision making at all. Anyways, just my two cents, this scene was bad in the novels, it's just as bad here. Siune's scene? It gets a bit funny because everyone's literally speaking Japanese in the anime. The sentiment remains the same of course, to convince others that they have been used by someone else, but it is undeniably harder to do it when you don't get to speak to other Korean people in Korean so you can explain to the Korean that they are in the wrong as a fellow Korean yourself. You see, Siune was Korean and that was why she decided to step up in hopes of properly communicating with the Korean players to understand why they think the way they think. And that was what brought Moonface forward as well as some other Korean players. The Chinese portion of the army was not even involved here as you can imagine, but they were also taken aback by the peaceful dialogue happening despite not understanding the context of course. And the good part of having language differences to be the highlight was that Siuna had actual proof that she was in the right when pushed forward to provide evidence. Her claim was that this was in fact a Japanese server and the proof was the underworlders themselves. If this was an American server they would be speaking English and thus showing them the NPCs of the world were speaking Japanese it would be proof enough that something about their story was amiss. But what followed next was further downplayed. Moonface was willing to listen to the story, but just when Siuna was about to talk about the Underworlders, a huge cleaver appeared in Moonface's chest, knocking him on the ground, with the man in the poncho standing in his place now rather than still on top of the statues. And the dagger that got stabbed to her shoulder hurt much less than the blade she stopped with her bare hands that almost got her hand ripped in half and the pain was easily drowned by the sense of despair, seeing how the man in black poncho destroyed all her chances of a meaningful conversation. Next up, yeah, I was expecting them to simply leave all of Leafa's scenes until next week, but I got nothing more to add here. An epic entrance, beautifully crisp drawings, and more epic Halo themes is always welcome. Over on Ocean Turtle, I got nothing to say either, I can talk again and again regarding the seal of the right eye, why Lilpilin is the third person to ever break the seal and not the fourth, how Iskan never broke the seal etc, but it would be repeats of what I've been talking about for over a year at this point. Second Alice, because Yuju is no longer alive obviously, and Kiku's explanation is something you heard from Quinella when Alice confronted her in the cathedral too, talking about how it wasn't an emotional outburst that Alice achieved, but a purely logical defiance, whereas Lil Pilin's breach came from an emotional decision, not from a lengthy, thought out decision making process. Yuji, for example, would fit to the second category as well. Moving over to Yanai and Higa scenes again, oh my god, this is painful to go back and forth in the novels, every event is half a page, constantly switching back and forth, I'm so glad the anime streamlined all of these. But again, you see Yanai, the one who installed the code 871, is an utter wimp. He is no murderer, in fact he surprised himself that he accidentally shot Higa in panic. He doesn't have the guts to kill anyone to begin with, He's just a despicable human being. Anyways, we'll <laughs> leave that story for next week, much like 
all stories featured this week, but I digress. Back in Underworld, we see the results of a dropped scene with Renly, Tisa and Sortilina. With fight getting more and more brutal, Renly agreed to personally protect Tisa and Lina, who wanted to drop their duties to protect Kirito and to fulfill their promises. Tisa to follow in the footsteps of Yujiro, who had died to protect the world to the best of his abilities, and Lina to fulfill her promise to Kirito to protect the world he gave so much of himself to save. What follows? Not sure if this is gonna be a surprise to you, <laughs> but, but the scenes with Asuna and others really downplays the brutality of these scenes. It's quite mellow compared to the descriptions in the novels. I'm sure some of this will be somewhat portrayed next week with certain acts of terror, let's say. But you know, detailed work that is very costly to animate and makes you more prone to layering errors. Even the minor bloodstains they had on Liz crossed over to Asuna's gauntlets as a layering error. But still, seeing the most being these rugged lines on armor here and there rather than destroyed armor, significant bloodstains, etc. It does take away. Egil is shown with three spears through his upper body. Yeah, that is that is brutal. But it is not as brutal as the following paragraph. Egil was so horribly disfigured that it was a wonder he had any hit points left at all. He must have fought like a man possessed to protect Shilika. Multiple broken swords and spears stuck out of his body and limbs looked like they'd all been crushed. His jaw was so clenched, surely to fight back against unimaginable, excruciating pain. Strong words do convey this wonderfully. Three spears matching three sweat drops on the face doesn't really do justice in comparison. Not really blaming the anime here or anything, strong things like these are hard to draw as is, let alone animate and very costly at that, but it is helpful for you to know the reality of the circumstances. There isn't a man lying down because he has three spears in his chest. He is lying there because he is utterly and undeniably destroyed physically and mentally in every possible aspect. And imagine that for everyone involved in the war now. Everyone's utterly destroyed and broken in every aspect here. I see people talking about how Asuna is so lame now that she can't even shrug things off the fight. These people who stub their toe lightly on the table and crawl on the ground crying in agonizing pain had the audacity to call it lame that Asuna literally cannot continue grabbing her rapier after enduring half a dozen nightmares, survive the unfiltered pain of losing her limbs or getting impaled dozens of times, literally collapsed puking blood because she almost got her brain destroyed due to spamming Stacia ability too much, who saw her friends fight to no end and getting crippled one by one, watching the enemy that outplayed them for two whole years not break a single sweat causing all this horror. So those of you who keep complaining about how powerless she seems, kindly fuck off. She went through hell a dozen times and still kept fighting to no end with no single hope in sight. If you're gonna claim she's lame or something, you gotta check your memory. It may be because you either have amnesia or you can't pay attention for more than 20 seconds without seeing flashy things. That's, that's on you, not on the series or not the downplayed brutality in the anime. It's still pretty fucking brutal on its own. Some people are naturally confused about why Liz is blaming herself like a big deal. Well, that's because, while this is a virtual environment, Underworld has no pain absorber. Well, not as severe or realistic as diving with an STL, all of these people do still feel significant pain and Liz effectively convinced all these people to join this bloodbath, thus blaming herself. Why does Asuna decide to surrender? Because she knows deciding to continue is willfully accepting the real worlders to get endlessly tortured and the underworlders to go for pointless suicide, they have lost plain and clear. The priority now is to ensure nobody else from the remaining bunch dies. Poe's revelation about Lovkov raid is just the tip of the iceberg and next week you will hear more about the Prince of Hell himself. Minor change here is that Ronya serves Kirto up on a silver plate, whereas in the novels, Kirto was brought here forcefully by a red soldier. Some more brutality was removed here and there as well. 
But the post credit scene, a very unexpected one to say the least, it is the SAO servers at the old Argus headquarters lighting up again. Well, it is a very intriguing shot with a lot of implications, first I'd like to punch it down real quick. SAO servers booting up is an inconsistency within the world, you see, after the ordinal scale event, SAO servers along with the ownership of the AI idol Yuna was given over to Kamura, and the SAO servers were kept running, so there's absolutely no reason for us to see them booting up here, they should be running normally as is. But anyways, this can lead into two interpretations, first one and the unlikely one is the remains of white Yuna doing some hijinks there, or the second one, the more likely one, black Yuna is doing some hijinks in there. I naturally do not know what they're doing as I do not see much that could be helpful inside the SEO servers, but I do have some minor theories. The key bit is, and that's where Yuna's importance comes in, white Yuna was the only one who was able to open up a connection from inside the SEO servers to the outside. However, White Yuna has ceased to exist, twice already in fact. And we know that the original Black Yuna was not able to establish a proper connection to the outside world in Cordial Chords, although back then she was in severe trouble, so that remains a possibility. But as I said, there's not much that can help the war effort back in Underworld, and the war effort is pretty much over at this point. It's only pain and depression from here on out, so as things stand, I am confused myself as to what they will do with this. Seriously, there's there's nothing left to do at this point. It's gonna take a bit more than minor changes if there's something meaningful to be done. But we're gonna have to wait and see. I was hoping the episode would end with the classroom scene cliffhanger, but we got 15 more pages until then. I still expect the classroom scene to be an ending cliffhanger though, so they potentially may shuffle some events here and there, and stretch things with some anime original developments to push classroom scene to the end of the episode. And then, we'll take a trip down the memory lane, it's it's basically your fast lane on highway to depression, so definitely look for- that, that doesn't sound right, you shouldn't look forward to it. <laughs> Anyways, as I said, great episode that was kind of wonky on multiple scenes due to lack of proper detail. It, it's similar to earlier episodes, but back then the details glossed over were not that vital stuff, like some non-relevant things were being dropped here and there that even helped the pacing. Here, it's not that. Things like Shinon's pendant or Asuna and Ko being utterly destroyed, kinda more important to convey properly, you know, otherwise people get confused. Next episode is titled The Devil's Son, but it seems Aniplex USA did not like the reference thinking it would be too much of a subtle one, so to make it easier for the masses, they turned it into Prince of Hell instead, which, if you haven't figured it out just yet, it's a title of the Devil's Son anyways, since he is the King of Hell. Weekly illustration Q&A is back, though I kinda screwed up the weekly part as usual. Anyways, if you have questions that you feel like were not answered in this explained video, do ask them below in the comment section with hashtag AskGamerTurk. If your question is regarding the future, please add a spoiler warning and give it a couple blank lines to push the spoilers away. And no, I will not answer spoiler questions for the sake of spoilers, like when will Kirito wake up? If you're that curious for spoilers, just read the books, Amazon and Book Depository links are in the description. But if you made it this far, hit that like button and subscribe and hit the bell icon and comment bring on the meat chopper down below to let me know. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter for the fastest news possible, Lens Squad merch is still around, but now we got Medina, Kirtan, Yujo merch too, so do check it out. A huge thanks to all my patrons and channel members as always, and until next time, stay cool.